Tonight I want to continue on with the series that we're in. We've been, um, we commenced a series on the four faces of the sons of God. The four faces of the sons of God. And uh, we've been kind of working our way through that. In Revelation 4 and verse 7 it speaks of the faces of the Lord Jesus Christ or faces of a particular creature which portrayed the Lord Jesus Christ. Revelation 4 and verse, uh, was it Revelation 4? Yeah, Revelation chapter 4 and verse 7. It says, And the first beast was like a lion, the second a calf or an ox, and the uh, third as a man, and the fourth as a flying eagle. And then we pick that up in Ezekiel chapter 1, where Ezekiel saw the same uh, creature, which depict the four faces um, of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we've been looking at this um, in connection with us in the last days, the four faces of the sons of God. And uh, we've looked at the eagle, and uh, that was the one we first started with, was the, the eagle. We've looked at the face of a, a man. And uh, tonight, uh, we're going to look at the face of the ox. Okay, the face of the ox. And what that just speaks to us tonight. One of the faces of the Lord Jesus Christ was the face of an ox. He had four faces. Last week we looked at his face as a man, but he also had the face of an ox, the face of a lion, the face of an eagle, the face of an ox, and the face of a man. And one of the these are characteristics which portray the nature or an emphasis and the nature of God's people in the last days. And uh we need lion-like qualities. We need eagle-like qualities. But we also remember from last week, you still remain a man or a woman. You still have a humanity. Now, the ox in Scripture very, very clearly always speaks of a, a, a beast of burden. Or ox was always something which worked. Okay? And um, it was the um, tractor of the day in which um, these words were written. In fact, in many third world countries today, the ox is the tractor. And uh, they just use an ox for plowing, for hauling loads, uh, all kinds of those um, menial labors. And uh, it is a beast of work. It is a beast of burden. And this is one of the faces of the Lord Jesus Christ and one of the faces of the sons of God in these last days. Now, minding up with wings as an eagle is fantastic and it's necessary, but the sons of God also have the face of an ox. And that speaks of an earthly existence, bearing loads and bearing burdens. The face of an ox. And it's fantastic to soar on the currents of the winds of the Spirit. And that is good and, and that is necessary and, and, and that's great and we need that to rise up in the realms of the Spirit, but we also have to work on the earth. There are burdens. There is work to be done. And the ox was another face of the Lord Jesus Christ, and it is another face of God's people in these last days. Second Corinthians 6 and verse 1 says, We are workers together with God. And that portrays that kind of a thing we're talking about. Labors together with God, or work is together with God, the ox uh, has to work. Okay, the ox has to work. That's its function. Its function is work. Its function is to labor. Um, it's, uh, that, that's its nature. That's its function. That is its use. And so I want us to look at this tonight, being employed or being involved in the service of the Lord. There are three levels of service which I want to talk to you about tonight in God. Three levels of service which are important. And um, all are profitable, all are necessary, but we will mature from one level to another. There are three levels and of service. Those who kind of mature on and reach some of the highest levels can always reach back to the lower levels and minister and help. Um, but those in the lower levels must mature and um, before they can come on up into the second level before they're capable of serving there. 
And uh, the first level, which I want to talk to you about, which is important and necessary, and we need to understand, and I just pray that the Lord will give us some kind of maturity and understanding tonight, um, because we uh, some of the things I want to say to you in connection with the service of the Lord. We all begin, we come to the Lord, and somewhere down the line, we all begin by coming, uh, learning to be workers for God. At some level in our life, we learn to uh, work for God. And this initially or primarily is the response to the commandments of the Lord or it's a response to a precept. A precept is a command. And so we learn because if God asks certain things in his word, requires certain things of us, we see a command in his word and so we set our will to do it. And we work for God. No matter what, what areas or what areas of life or what situations or how relevant it is, we enter into a level of serving God by working for Him. And um, this is a, an interesting area. It's a type of service for God. It's an important area, but it's a lower level, but it is an important area. And uh, it begins in obedience and is uh, useful and usually orientated to the needs of people. Um, at this level, it's often legalistic in its expression. I'll explain that in just a moment. Um, for instance, we can take the classic uh, scripture of uh, Mark 16 and verse 15. All missions programs have been birthed um, out of this um, just one verse of scripture. And um, let's just read it. You'll be familiar with it in Mark 16 and verse um, 15. It says, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Okay. There's a commandment of the Lord. That's a precept. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel um, to every creature. And so... People rise up in obedience to that. I have been in so many, when I was, particularly when I was younger, and uh, I've been in so many services where um, missionary, missions orientated, where that verse was used with a kind of commandment. If you're not doing anything, you should be doing something, because the Bible says, go you into all the world and preach the gospel. That's the commandment of the Lord. Now, why aren't you doing it? And, uh, and so people were conscripted um, to respond um, to the word of the Lord, the words of scripture, and go ye into all the world. And people would rise up in obedience to that. Most missions programs were founded on this precept of just the Bible said, go ye into all the world. We're not doing it, so we should begin to do it. Okay, and so quite often whole missions organizations ministries were founded on this just one precept. We are going to be workers, we're going to work for God. We're going to serve God and we're going to work for Him. And um, it's fine. It's, uh, it gets some of the job done. Many, many people have been enlisted in the service of the Lord at this level. In fact, most of the whole evangelical scene is on this level and um, beginning to become uh, workers for God. Now, before we to become too critical of that, it's necessary. That is a great workforce in the body of Christ today at this level. Great missions programs are um, born out of that level, and it gets some of the job done, and it's necessary. But at its best, it is, if you like, out-of-court ministry. Those people are working for God. And um, it's, a, it's a wonderful thing. It's a necessary thing. A lot of missionaries find their way out of the mission field and work for God all of their life out of that precept. They were challenged somewhere at a missionary meeting. Go ye into all the world. And they said, I'll go then. I'll go into all the world. And they go and work and they're good people. And there's a measure of blessing and a measure of success. And they are working for God. And that's fine. It's an out-of-court ministry. It's genuine service. These are good people. But there is um, another level of service which I want to talk to you about. 
And we're talking about the ox tonight who is a, a servant, one who serves, one who bears the burdens. And I've known missionary people who, who've known them firsthand, who've spent their whole lives on the mission field and worked for God all of their lives, sacrificed. They've worked for God. Some of them saw some fruit, some of them saw very little, but they worked for God with tremendous sacrifice. And they were good people, and they were godly people, and they were serving God on this level. They were working for God. It's an out-of-court ministry, but they're working for God. There is another lesson, there is another level, if you like, which um, God will bring us into, and that is learning to serve or minister with God. Now, in the scripture which I quoted, I should maybe just read it to you in Second Corinthians six one. Let me just read it to you. In Second Corinthians six one, it says, "Then we are workers together with Him." That's the Lord Jesus Christ. We are workers this time together with the Lord Jesus Christ, and um, so we have that 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 concept: workers together. Uh, with the Lord Jesus Christ in in First Corinthians three nine and it reads like this as well in First Corinthians three and verse nine it reads like this for we are laborers together with God. Okay, the first level of service is the response to a precept, a command in the Word of God. We work for God. The second level is a little different. We learn to minister. We are workers together with God. There is a lot of difference between serving God and working with Him. Um, there's a lot of this difference between those two things. Working for God or working with God. And the second level of service is working with God. You know, you might be hired for a job. To do a job, you receive instructions on um, what what the job involves and what is to be done and then you set about doing it. Okay, you just hired for the job, you see the instructions, you know what has to be done and so you get on and finish that assignment. Or you can join with the boss in, on the job and work alongside him. Now there's a difference, a very big difference. In the second area you get on the job training. And there's a responsibility is primarily God's. It's a whole different level of service. And we, we really need to kind of understand it and uh, understand the difference between the two. Working for God or working with God. Now, Jesus, in his day, he had a, he spoke to the people, the people who were weary and overworked and uh, of the of his day, he spoke to those people and he said, Come unto me, all you are weary and heavy laden. Remember the scripture we quoted it the other day. And I will give you rest. Matthew 11 and verse 28. And then he said, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. You shall find rest unto your souls. Matthew 11, 28 through to 30. All ye that are weary and heavy laden. He's speaking to the people of his day. He said, You can come unto me. But he said, Take my yoke upon you. And that was the key. Taking his yoke, you will find rest. Now the yoke was for oxes. There was a yoke and the yoke was for the ox. And uh, you know they would yoke two oxes together with a great wooden yoke over their neck and down over their shoulders. And then they, those oxen would pull a cart or they would pull a plow. They were burden, beasts of burden and beasts of work. And um, and it's, um, he said, if you learn to work with me, not working for me anymore. In a way, when you're working for him, you're a little on your own out there working for God. But he said, there's another level of service which you can come into where there's much more rest, there's not so much striving, there's not so much a sweat involved in it, but things do get done. It's, uh, it's not inactivity, but if you take his yoke upon you, and learn of Him. You know, you can't be in the same yoke with the Lord Jesus Christ and not learn something. His yoke. You get into His yoke with Him. 
And uh, he said, learn then of me. Jesus, with the face of an ox, the yoke, you get into his yoke. You know, if you, if you go to Indonesia, you'll find in Indonesia, they, you'll see a large ox um, yoked to a much smaller ox and they're working away in the fields. And you ask them, you know, why, why do they do that? Why do they yoke a large ox with a smaller ox? It looks kind of ridiculous, really. Yeah, there's a little ox trying to put away and you have this great big ox next to it. And um, they'll tell you that um, it's to the, to train the smaller one. The, the little ox has to go everywhere the big ox goes. That's it. He just doesn't have the strength to resist him. If the um, little ox wants to turn left and the big ox doesn't want to, that's the end of the story. He just doesn't have the strength. And, you know, it, and he says he learns from that big ox just how to work. He learns to be disciplined. He learns how to do it right. And this is the kind of picture we have here of the Lord Jesus Christ being yoked together with him. And um, we're now serving God, not just as a response to a command, but we're learning to serve God as a response to a partner. You become a partner with the Lord. And it's a very different level. And um, on the second level, all we have to do is follow the bigger ox. Jesus with the face of an ox. There's all lessons to be learned here. You say, all right, you say, Lord, I want to move on to service with you. I want to mature in the things of God. Let me be yoked with you. I want to follow you. Uh, I want you to lead me. I want to work alongside you. And so he gets a great big yoke and goes plunk. First thing you realize, restrictions. When that yoke is on you, boy, it's a whole different world. There's a lot of lessons to be learned. Once you get yoked to the Lord Jesus, you have to move with him. You don't move with him, the plow is liable to come up over your back. You know, you can't stop and let him go. It's it. When he moves, that's it. You move with him. It's a whole different ball game. Whereas you can be living out there, working out there, and working for God, and you decide on lots of things you can do for God, and God will bless them to a measure, and there will be a measure of fruit, and that's fine. But there's another level. There's another level of service for God. There's another level which that ox has to get into. And that is the yoke. Tremendous release comes when you learn to move with God. You know, the Lord doesn't take any votes. He's no committees with him. He's never heard of democracy. And he decides to move. That's it. He moves. You get a great big ox, and if he decides to move, that little ox has no option. He either gets dragged along or he gets up and walks. And uh, that's the way it is. And that little ox just waits for him to move, and he learns very quickly. It's a lot more comfortable to move with him. It's a lot more comfortable when that big ox walks out. I better get up and go with him. You get dragged, it's difficult to hang back. That plow gets very close to you behind. Uh, the cart catches up with you and you're in big trouble. It's better just, he learns very quickly how to respond to the Lord. He learns very, very quickly how to move uh, with the other ox. You know, in Psalm 123, there's a very, very interesting psalm there. And uh, in Psalm 123, and it reads like this. It says, Under thee do I lift up mine eyes, O thou that dwellest in the heavens, behold, as the eyes of the servant looks to the hand of their masters, and the eyes of the maiden into the hand of her mistress, so our eyes wait upon the Lord our God. Very, very interesting portion of scripture. Talking about, you see, the servant. And, um, you know, wouldn't it be, it'd be terrible if you had somebody you were working with, you had a servant in the house, and all the time that servant was running up to him saying, what do I do next? Tell me to do something, give me something to do. You know, they'd drive you up the wall if you had that kind of situation. You know, they would wait there, they were trained, the servant was wait there, and they would just wait with their eyes upon the master, or the mistress of the house. And just by reading their eyes, they would know what to do. They wouldn't move until they'd been told to move. And it says, our eyes wait upon the Lord. 
See, a whole different area of service for God, different area of activity, and a different area of fruitfulness. And um, you just wait for that ox to move. Okay? Your eyes wait upon the Lord. And it says here that the, the, and it's descriptive of a servant and a master in Psalm 123 here, but it says, and just in the same way, our eyes wait upon the Lord. We don't do anything, we don't get involved in anything, don't run off anywhere until we get the response from the eyes of the master. Our eyes wait. Our eyes wait. You know, you can, it's, it's kind of, in the old fashioned days, they used to have telegrams delivered by hand. I can just imagine this. And they had a little guy who would be working there, and he'd sit in a telegraph office until something came over the wires, and the guy would write it down and give it to him, and call him over and give it to him, and off he'd go. He'd deliver the message. Okay? He'd take the telegram. Can you imagine that little kid sitting there, and every two minutes he'd say, Have you got anything for me? Is anything through yet? Can you give me something? That he'd drive him up the wall. But he waited there until a hand went out and he then came over. Our eyes wait upon the Lord. See, it's a different uh, level of service. When he is ready to move, he moves. And we learn to move with him. And it's a different level of fruitfulness. It's a different level of relationship. It's um, a level of relationship where we are following, we are yoked together, we are workers together with God. Not working for Him, but we are workers together with God. And you learn very quickly, when He turns, you turn. It will be very sore neck, you know, that big ox is going along and he turns right and you try to turn left. You're either going to break your neck or have a very badly bruised neck. You learn to turn very quickly. You learn to follow. Um, in Proverbs 21 and verse 1, it reads about the uh, heart. In Proverbs 21 verse 1 it says, The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord, and the rivers of water, he turneth it like rivers of water, he turneth it whithersoever he will. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. And just like a river, he turns it whithersoever he will. That's the kind of relationship he wants to bring us into. Not serving God, not working for God in, in that sense, but now working with Him. And He turns us with us however He will. Our heart of the King is in the hand of the Lord. And once we are yoked to Him, you lo lose a whole load of options. Okay? Now you can be a little ox in the field and have everything nice and fine and eat grass or whatever they eat and do everything else. But you'll never be really any, anything useful for God until they get a yoke on you. But when they get a yoke on you, you lose your freedom. Okay? You just lose a, lose a whole load of options. When he turns, you've got to turn. You can say, well, I don't want to go that way. Brother, you're in that, a boom. The big ox goes, you go. He stops, you stop. He moves, he moves, you move. And so there is a yoke which brings a restriction, if you like, in some ways into our life, but glorious freedom and blessing. And these options of where we move and where we serve. We have one option only, and that is we are partners with God. And it brings us to an end of a load of frenzied activity. Busyness can mean barrenness in Christian service. But you're no longer working for God, you're working with God. And it's a different plane of service for the Lord. It's a different plane of relationship um, with Him. It's a different plane of, of moving with God. There's another problem you have too, because you've got one yoke, and the yoke is the same size for both animals, but one's a little animal. Okay? And... Um, you can only drink and eat when he drinks and eats. Only when he puts his head down, you can't get your head down, he's just got a great big massive shoulders up there, you try and pull that yoke down and eat something, and he doesn't want to eat. 
you don't eat. You don't get that low. You know, there's water there to drink, and you want to drink, but he doesn't want to drink. That's it. See, the ox, the face of an ox, when he bends, bends down to drink, you bend down to drink. Thirsty or not, you drink. He's bending, you might get another chance for quite a while. So as long as he comes down and lowers the yoke, you think you take your opportunity and you drink. Or you eat. There's only the only time that that yoke is low enough for you to reach the grass or reach the water is when he bends. Hmm. This plays havoc with your schedule for eating and drinking. Your devotions. See, in the first level, you have souls, everything is set, everything is worked out nicely, everything is planned, you're going to have set devotions. Seven o'clock every morning, you have a devotion. Now, I'm not knocking devotions, it's great. And that came out of that, the turn of the century, a great move. Now, I'm all for devotions. But what I'm saying is another way. And in the other way, you're going to have more devotions than you ever had before. But it might not be on your time. And this is the thing. See, it's a different level of service. The first level is very legalistic. Now there's a room for it and it's necessary and a lot of people are enlisted in the service of the Lord at that level and they work for God and things get done. But there is another, and it's very legalistic, but there is another level and that's workers together with God. You know, he always feeds at the wrong time. Have you ever noticed that? Just when you plan to do something, he decides to drink. Just when you want to go somewhere, or just when you you feel God's giving you revelation from the Word, you know, your time is up, you've got to go somewhere. He always drinks at the awkward time, the wrong time for us. Breaks up our schedule, breaks up our kind of neatly packaged little life, and uh, creates all kinds of problems in that area. You say, well, it's all right, Lord, I know, you know, I'll get to it later. Okay, see, fine. You find that when you get back to it, he's no longer eating. You can't even get down there. You say, I'll come back to it later. Well, now, where was I in the word? Now, yeah, God was speaking to me from here. Blank. He's not feeding. You missed it. You can't get anything out of it. There's no anointing. It was time to feed back there. When he moved, it was time to drink. There was a real thirst back there. It was time to drink back there. You come back to it, and you can't get into it because his head is high. He's not down there anymore, and there's no way you can force the yoke down. See, it's a whole different ball game. It's a whole different level. You have a prayer burden. You say, pray God, but say, Lord, don't give it to me now. Um, I've got, you know what, I'm, you know how busy I am. You know my schedule today. I've got to go and visit so and so, and so and so's got to come across here, and 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 we plan this. So fine, that's fine. And you say, I'll catch up with it later. You go through your day. You come home and say, Lord, I'm going to pray now. The burden's not there. You know, it's like praying into a brick wall. She's not there. The burden was there when. He lowered his head when the Spirit of God moved. That's when the burden was. This plays havoc with your friends. Because you're going to have to get on the phone and say, Look, I've got a burden from the Lord, I just can't meet with you today. And the pressure from friends can be very difficult. But if you get into a yoke, your friends are secondary. And if he starts turning left, you better turn left. It's going to hurt your neck. I mean, you've got stiff necks out there. It's trying to go the opposite way, the yoke. You turn left and that's it. Pressure of people, demands of people. This is more God-orientated than people-orientated. It's a different level of service for God. Sometimes friends don't understand. You've got to explain to them, look, I just feel God speaking to me. I just feel a burden for prayer. I'm sorry, I can't be with you today. I'm sorry if it's put you out, but I'd rather put you out and put God out. And... Um, that's it. That's the reality of it. And if you have good friends, they'll understand that. If they don't understand it, change your friends. And, um, you know, you've got a problem. And uh, learning to move, you see, 
Ah, with the yoke. Ever notice sometimes he starts, that big old ox will get up in the middle of the night and start to eat. You know, in a nice sleep and suddenly you yank to your feet as he stands up. You know, your feet are almost off the ground. Great big ox stands up and it's the middle of the night. He said, well, we don't want to eat in the middle of the night. We're not thirsty. But the ox has stood up and you are yoked to him. You're yoked to the moving of his spirit. The yoke, you're yoked to his movement. You're learning discipline. And suddenly you come wide awake in the night. There's a burden. It's time to feed. I don't know why he does that in the night, but he does it anyway. And uh, he gets up. Here in a different level of service for God. And so you get up pick up your Bible or whatever, you go into another room where it's quiet, no one else is snoring, and you just sit down there and you wait on God. And you wait on God. And then he begins to feed you. He discharges burdens of prayer through you. You begin to drink and you begin to eat. You begin to have fellowship. There's the Spirit of the Lord moves. There's an anointing. He begins to talk to you. And it's three o'clock in the morning and you're eating. See, it's different. You can be yanked to your feet by the yoke and still stay asleep and miss it all. But when he speaks in the night, you've got to learn to respond. Yoke to the Lord as an ox is a whole different ball game. There's an interesting scripture or interesting passage of scripture in the Song of Solomon. It's written in very poetic language. Um, in the Song of Solomon chapter 5, And um, verse 2, Song of Solomon. Song of Solomon's after Ecclesiastes. Okay, chapter 5, beginning at verse 2, it says, I sleep, but my heart is awakening. It is the voice of my beloved that knocketh, saying, Open to me, my sister, my love. Okay, my dove, my undefiled, for my head is filled with dew and my locks with the drops of the night. I have put off, and then the response, I have put off my coat, how shall I put it on? I've washed my feet, I won't get them dirty again. My beloved put his hand by the hole of the door, and I was moved for him, I rose up to open. And then the time she got to the door, and she got all her makeup on, everything else, it gone. Verse 6, I opened to my beloved, but my beloved hath withdrawn himself and was gone. And it's a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ when he comes to us. And we say, well, it's not convenient, Lord. It's this, it's that, the other. But you've got to learn to come to a place when he knocks at the door, you respond, you drop everything. And if you try to put it off and say, I'll catch it later, you'll go to the door and he won't be there, he's gone. That's the kind of thing we're talking about. It's a whole kind of restriction, greater restriction on your life. Less options, greater dedication. You are being yoked with Him. You're learning to grow. You're learning to be yoked to the Lord Jesus Christ. You're learning to serve in the holy place instead of the outer court. You're learning a whole new level of service for God. You're learning to move in the realms of the Spirit. You're learning to work with Him instead of working for Him. He's working alongside you. You are working alongside Him. You move when He moves. You pray when He drops a burden. You respond to the Lord. You eat when He eats. You turn when He turns. And He comes in different times. He breaks up your schedule. He tears into pieces your little devotional time which you've had for years. Because he's bringing you up onto another level in God. It's important to have devotions, but if you come into this level, you're going to have far more and greater fellowship with God than just some kind of disciplined, regimented thing, which is important to have and necessary as you grow in God. But there is another level. This level uh, which we move up to in God. There's another thing is when he rests, you rest. There's not all this frenzied activity. 
When he stops, you stop. When he rests, you rest. When he moves, you move. To minister or serve God, minister or work for the Lord, is a response to a precept or a response to a command. It's an out of court situation. Regulated, legalistic, necessary, worthwhile, valid, but there is another level, the holy place, where your work is with God. That's a response to not a command, but it's a response to a partner now. You are yoked together with someone, the Lord Jesus Christ, and it's a response to a partner, moving and learning to move with him, learning to, to flow in the things of God. The holy place, learning to serve him at that level in God. God is trying to get the whole of Christendom at that level in God. The other level, you know, I, I have seen missionaries so tired, so worn out. I have seen missionaries die of overwork. I have seen them sacrifice tremendously. And that's, it's, it's, it's fantastic and they have a fantastic reward. I'm not knocking that. And the lots of things wouldn't, the foundations wouldn't have been laid for us in this generation if those people hadn't gone out and worked for God. So no, not knocking, I don't get me wrong, but you see, they wore out for God. They burned out for God. They sacrificed themselves, they sacrificed their children. Some of those missionaries, their kids were at boarding school, you know, and they wouldn't see them for maybe two, two or three years at a time. Sometimes they were separated from their wives for three or four years at a run. You think we've got something to complain about today? We don't know we're alive. Those people sacrificed back there at the turn of the century. They work hard for God and they accomplish great things. You see, God wants to bring us into another level where the frenzied activity stops, where the fruitfulness is greater, and we learn to be yoked to Him. We learn to move with Him. We come into rest. And Jesus said, all of those who are overworked in the service of the Lord, worn out in the service of the Lord, come unto me to take my yoke upon you. It'll be easy. I'll, I can, when I move, you're able to move with me. And I regulate your life. And you'll move with me. Get my yoke on you. When I go, you'll go. When I turn, you'll turn. When I stop, you stop. When I feed, you'll feed. And the transition is great. But it's worthwhile. But if you say tonight, oh, I want the yoke of the Lord on me, your options are going out the window very quick. Your life is no longer your own. And that's a different level of service. It's a different level of commitment and consecration to God. Flow with Him, a holy place, working with God, not for Him anymore. <coughs> Yoked with Him and moving with Him. Then there's another level, which I don't want to major on tonight because we're not quite there yet. That is the holiest of all. That there's learning to move in response to a person. One is a response to a precept or a command. That's the first area we were dealing with. Second area is the response to a partner. Now we're dealing with the, an intimacy, a response to a person where we minister now solely to God's needs. Everything else flows out of that. Everything is done as an act of worship at this level. Everything is done as an act of worship. Now I won't get into that because it'll take me two or three weeks to teach on that. But I, so I don't want to get into it tonight. But everything is done as an act of worship to meet his needs. To meet his needs. And that's a whole different level of fruitfulness again. And we'll teach on that sometime, but I just wouldn't have time to teach on that. But we're talking about the ox. And ox is, speaks of service for God, speaks of serving the Lord. It is a burden of, of uh, a beast of burden, but service. But there are levels of service in God. And we need to understand that. And there comes a day, you see, when that ox grows up. And it can grow. You know, it's very, very interesting. There's a scripture in, in the book of Isaiah that says, The yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing. And in the Hebrew, there, it's, the word anointing is because of the fatness or strength. 
The Hebrew word is fatness. When that, they had to put a yoke on a, an animal, but when that animal grew and grew and got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, it cracked the yoke. And the yoke fell off. Okay? And you can get a, an animal to a point where it doesn't require a yoke anymore. It is so disciplined, it will just move with God. The yoke is not required because of the growth that yoke is destroyed and sons of God are manifest. Sons of God are released in the earth to move as Jesus moved. And there is a manifestation of God's sons in the earth because the yoke now is broken off because of the strength and the maturity that has come. And the yoke is destroyed because of the strength. We all, you know, must know times of... Um, Burden-bearing, work. That's the ox. You can't always be eagles. There are always times of burdens and work and people and pressures. You must learn to serve on earth and work where the pressure and the demands of work are. But praise God, you can't be an ox all the time. Because one of the faces was an eagle. And there are times to just soar in the spirit. Eagles, other eagles don't need much ministry. The oxes need a lot of ministry. But up there, eagles don't need a lot of ministry. It's a different level and it's a different realm. But you can't stay up there for always. It's necessary to be an eagle with all the characteristics of the eagle. We talked about that. But you can't be an eagle for always and you can't be an ox always. The two have to be balanced together. You can touch God in the heavenlies and minister to the needs of people in the earth by the anointing and by the power where you touch God in those heavenly realms. You can't always be eagles. You're not an ox all the time. You have the face of a man. There's a human sign. Face of a man. Characteristics of an eagle and an ox. I want to kind of just read a, a story to you, a vision to you that tonight, which will give you something of an understanding in which I'm saying tonight, at the harness of the Lord. This vision unfolded like this. It said, on a dirt road in the middle of a wide field stood a beautiful carriage, something in the order of a stagecoach, but all edged with gold with beautiful carvings. It was pulled by six large chestnut horses, two in the lead, two in the middle, and two in the rear. But they weren't moving. They weren't pulling the carriage. And I wondered why. Then I saw the driver underneath the carriage, on the ground, on his back, just behind the last two horses' heels, working on something between the front wheels of the carriage. I thought, boy, he is in a dangerous place. If one of those horses kicked or stepped back, they could kill him. Or if they decided to go forward or got frightened and panicked, they would pull the carriage right over him. But he didn't seem afraid, for he knew that those horses were disciplined and would not move until he told them to move. The horses were not stamping their feet, they weren't acting restless. Though there were bells on their feet, the bells were quiet. They were simply standing still and quiet, waiting for the voice of the master. As I watched the harnessed horses, I noticed two young colts coming out of the open field. They approached the carriage and seemed to say to the horses, Come, come and play with us. We've got many fine gains. We'll race with you. Come and chase us. And with that, the colts kicked up their heels, flicked their tails, and raced across the open field. But when they looked back, they saw that the horses hadn't moved. They weren't following. They were puzzled. They knew nothing of the harnesses. They couldn't understand why the horses didn't want to play. So they called to him, called to them, Why don't you race with us? Are you tired? Are you weak? Don't you have any strength to run? But the horses answered not a word. They didn't stamp their feet or toss their heads, but they stood quiet, still, waiting for the voice of the master. Again the cults called to them, Why? Do you stand so still in the hot sun? Come over here in the shade of this nice tree. 
See how green the grass is. You must be hungry. Come and feed with us. It's so green and so good and you look thirsty. Come and drink of this stream over here. But the horses answered them with not so much a glance, but stood still waiting for the command for the king to send them forward. Then the scene changed. And I saw a lariat nooses, a lasso fall around the necks of the two colts. They were led off to the master's corral for training and discipline. How sad they were as those lovely green fields disappeared and they were put into the confinement of a corral with its brown dirt and high fences. The colts ran from one fence to another seeking freedom but found that they were confined to this place of training. And then the trainer began to work on them. What a death for those who had been all their lives accustomed to such freedom. They could not understand the reason for this, this terrible discipline. What great crime had they done to deserve this? Little did they know of the responsibility that was theirs when they had submitted to the discipline and learned to perfectly obey the master and finish their training. All they knew was that this processing was the most horrible thing they had ever known. One of the cults rebelled under the training and said, This is not for me. I like my freedom. I like the green hills, the flowing streams, the fresh water. I will not take any more of this confinement. This is terrible. So he found a way out, jumped the fence, and ran happily back, back to the meadows across the field. And I was astonished that the master let him go and didn't go after him. But he devoted his attention to the remaining cult. This cult though he had the same opportunity to escape, decided to submit his own will and learn the ways of the master. The training got harder than ever, but he was rapidly learning more and more how to obey the slightest wish of the master and to respond to even the quietness of his voice. I saw that there had been no training, no testing, there would have been neither submission nor rebellion from either of the cults. For in the field they did not have the choice to rebel or submit. They were kind of free. But when brought to the place of testing and training and discipline, then was made manifest to the obedience of one and the rebellion that lay in the heart of the other. And though it seemed safer to, not to come to the place of discipline because of the risk, yet I saw that Without this, there could be no sharing of his glory. Finally, this period of training was over. He was now rewarded with his freedom and sent back to the fields. Oh no, but a greater confinement than ever took place, as a harness dropped about his shoulders. Now he found there was not even freedom to run about the small corral, for on the harness he could only move when and where his master spoke. And unless his master spoke, he stood still. The scene changed, and I saw the other colt standing on the side of a hill, nibbling at some grass. Then across the fields and down the road came a king's carriage, drawn by six horses. With amazement, he saw that in the lead and on the right-hand side was his brother colt, now made strong and mature on the good corn in the master's stable. He saw the lovely figure of this horse pulling the carriages with the others. Envy came into his heart. Thus he complained to himself, Why has my brother been so honored and I am so neglected? Why have they given him these wonderful things? The master hasn't given me this kind of responsibility of pulling his carriage, nor put about me his golden harness. Why have they chosen my brother instead of me? And by the Spirit, the answer came back as I watched, because one submitted to the will and discipline of the master, and one rebelled. The scene changed again, and I, I saw a great drought sweep across the countryside. The green grass became dead and dry, brown and brittle. The streams of water dried up and stopped flowing. There was only small muddy puddles, puddles, we keep that English out, puddles everywhere. I saw this little cult. 
He didn't seem to grow. He ran here and there across the fields looking for fresh streams and green pastures. Finding none, he ran in circles, always looking for something to feed his famished spirit upon. But there was a famine in the land, and the rich green pastures of flowing stream of yesterday were not to be had. And one day the cult stood on the hillside, weak, wobbly on his legs, wondering where to go next to find food and how to get strength to go. It seemed like there was no use for, for good food. There was no food anywhere. The flowing streams were a thing of the past. It seemed like a great storm had come across the land. And the effort to find more food just taxed his waning spirit. Suddenly, he saw the king's carriage coming down the road, pulled by six great horses. And he saw his brother, fat and strong, muscles rippling, sleek and beautiful with much grooming. And his heart was amazed and perplexed, and he cried out, My brother, where do you find the food to keep you strong and fat in these days of famine? I have run everywhere in my freedom, searching for food, and I can't find any. Where do you, in your awful confinement, find this food in time of drought? Tell me, please, I must know. Then the answer came back from a voice filled with victory and praise. In my master's house, there is a secret place. In the confining limitations of his stable where he feeds me by his own hand. His granaries never run empty, and his wells never run dry. And with this, the Lord made me to know that in the day when people are weak and famished in their spirits, in the time of spiritual famine, those who have lost their own wills and have come to the secret place of the Most High and have taken the yoke of the Lord and that confinement of his perfect will shall have plenty of the corn of heaven and a never-ending flow of fresh streams of the revelation by his Spirit. Then the vision ended. That's a remarkable story. But it really conveys something of what the Spirit of God is saying to us in this day. The harness of the Lord. An ox. An ox, to serve as an ox, requires a harness. One of the faces of the sons of God in these last days is the face of an ox who has learned to be yoked to the Master. Bringing us into a whole different kind of life, a whole different kind of service for God, a whole different kind of relationship with Him. And you look around and you say, you know, these people seem so free, those people seem to have everything their way, the same, everything so free. And why me, Lord? Why the precious? Why the discipline? Uh, there's a yoke on you. Sure, your neck might get a bit bruised now and again. You get yanked off your feet every second day when you, if you not miss him. You miss the moving of his spirit. Sure, he starts to feed in the middle of the night. You say, oh, that's a pain. Why doesn't he feed in the morning? Or before I go to bed, why don't you want to get up at three o'clock and eat? Just when I plan something, there's a burden to pray. I can feel him knocking at the door. He wants to draw me aside. And so you respond. And you learn those disciplines of the moving of God's Spirit. You learn that God comes first and people come second. And you're no longer working for God, but you're working with Him. You're moving in the holy place. You're learning what it means to rise in heavenly places of the Spirit. You're learning to be led of the Spirit. You're learning not to get involved in things which God is not involved in. You're moving with Him. And the fruitfulness is increasing. You're learning to become sons of God. And you're learning to take on the face of an ox. Sure, you can soar like an eagle, but you've also got the face of an ox. Sure, you're a human being, the face of a man, but you've also got the face of an ox. Profiles of the sons of God in the last days. One of the profiles is an ox. 
yoked to the master. You willing for that kind of service? Are you willing for that kind of relationship? You willing to say, Lord, put your yoke on me. I want to learn. Let me learn quick. Let that yoke come upon me. I want to move with you. Work alongside you, not work for you. I want to work alongside you. The ox requires a yoke. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, or where the Spirit is Lord, there is true liberty. Where the Spirit of God is Lord in your life, where that harness is upon you. You know, it's like a horse. You can train some of those horses. A horses are around. I've had some incredible experiences with horses. I've ended up flying through the air on more than one occasion. Because horses, they're headstrong. Yeah, you get a headstrong horse and, you know, it's, it's sometimes they're hard to handle. But if it gets properly trained, it'll stand there. You won't even have to hold the reins. It'll stand there. Just with the movement of your leg, it'll move. Or just you lean your body to one side and he'll move. You don't even have to, have to use the reins in the end. Just the movement of your body will keep him going in whatever direction you want. He won't take off on you. He won't panic. If you ride shooting and there's a gunshot goes off, he won't panic and take off down the road with you. He's disciplined. He's learned. Just the slightest touch on the reins can guide him. He knows when to move quickly, he knows when to slow down, he knows when to stop. Without any great pressure. You know, sometimes God's trying to get us in the, to move certain ways in our life, and he's got to put all kinds of pressures on us to get us into that place to move. And God doesn't want it that way. He wants it so we can just touch those reins, pick it up. As the eyes of the servant looks, watches the eyes of the master. And he moves with him. That kind of relationship. An ox. Moving with him. Yoked with him. He stands, you stand. When he drinks, you drink. Where he goes, you go. Moving with the ox. Disciplined. Ready. Prepared. The ability to soar like an eagle in the spirit. And serve on the earth like an ox. Profiles of sons of God in the last days. Four faces. And we have to come to the place where we say, Lord, I'm willing. I'm willing for your harness. Now you can rebel against that and he'll let you go. That's fine. And you'll stay there on that level. And you'll, you know, that's fine. Until the storm comes. Until the last days are upon us. And you've got to learn to hear God and move with God and you've got to be disciplined to survive. Then you're in trouble. And there can be freedom down that level until the storm comes, until the pressure's on. And only then your survival depends on having had the harness of the Lord upon you and learning to move with God. So in the long run, the harness is the thing, it's the way to go. You've got to be willing for that there's got to be a submission to that. You've got to say, Lord, I surrender all to you. My will, my rights. Put your harness on me. And I will learn of you. You are meek and lowly of heart. You won't hurt me. I'll learn of you. I'll come alongside you. Put your harness on. I'll find you will find rest under your soul. Learning to move with God. Let's pray. Hallelujah. <coughs> Father, we just thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, because you're forming it and you're fashioning people, you're preparing people in these last days to stand in the likeness and the image of God. Conform to his image. The image of a man, an eagle, a lion, an ox. 
conform to his image, to work the works of God in these end times. I pray, Lord, that you'll just speak to our hearts tonight in Jesus' name, by the operation of your Spirit, the mighty name of Jesus. Your Spirit, Lord, move upon our hearts tonight in Jesus' name. Open our understanding to these levels of service. Help us to trans transcend from one level to another. Where all striving ceases and we learn to flow and work with you. 